Hello, I'm the Executive Director at Chippewa County Historical Society and Museum, Travis Gross, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's edition of our Collectors and Collections program. Uh, this year we have 10 uh, displays on hand, anything ranging from original Barbies to Schlitz Brewing Company uh, memorabilia to old-timey radio shows. Uh, so uh, sit back, enjoy the show, uh, hopefully you learned something from, from our guest presenters, and uh, maybe next year you could be a presenter yourself. Yourself. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Redsack and I'm from Sheboygan and welcome to Collectors and their Collectibles at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum. My collection actually started when I was a little girl. These are my actual toys that I played with between the years 1959 and 1964. While a lot of women don't like to tell their age, I guess that's an okay thing when you're talking about collectibles. Down here we have my original um, Barbie doll with the bubble cut. I did have an original number one with the ponytail and I traded her in for the twist and turn which is in the orange bathing suit next to the Barbie doll. Ken is original, he has the fuzz hair, that's how you can tell he's an original. Alan is Midge's boyfriend, he came a little bit later in the series and Midge is in the box and then there's Skipper who is Barbie's little sister. The clothing that I had with all the accessories are actually depicted in the yellow for Skipper, the blue for Ken, and the pink for Barbie. Barbie's outfits were designed by a designer. Uh, most of them have zippers, snaps, and working buttons. Again, my range is from 19, probably 1959 to about 1964. Um, as we move down in my display, I do have a couple other things that are a little bit unique to my collection. I have my original autograph book. It was from when I was in fourth grade. Um, there's some things that unfortunately cannot be pulled back from there, but it's kind of a fun piece to have. I have two of the comic books that came out. Um, they sold for 12 cents a piece. Two of her storybooks. And did you know, just as a point, that Barbie was an actual cheesehead? She was born in Willow, Wisconsin on March 9th. Um, I also have some of the cutouts. I don't ha unfortunately have the paper dolls themselves, but I do have some of their outfits. And I have a lot of the Hallmark ornaments. Uh, I have a picture of my tree, which is done in all Barbie ornaments. The one in front, right here, is actually a signed Patricia Andrews piece of Hallmark. Patricia Andrews was the designer for most of the Hallmark ornaments uh, for the earlier issues. When I was a little girl, um, I had a jumper that was an aqua wool and my mother saved up a lot of money to get that jumper for me. And she had um, one of her friends make a jumper to match my Barbie doll for my Barbie doll and I have a picture of that with my Barbie doll there. Uh, as most little fashion divas of our time, um, we idolized Barbie. Barbie was the doll for us. We got rid of our Betsy Wetsies, we got rid of our bride dolls, we got rid of our walking dolls and we moved on to the sophisticated world of Barbie. And as such, I also became a member of her fan club. These are all of the magazines from her original fan club along with my membership card and the stickers that went with it. Um, I am going to move over a little bit to this other table um, where I have the Dream House and the Fashion Shop. The Dream House is Barbie's home away from home. When she wasn't on the road, this is where she lived. You know, Barbie was a fashion model as a teenager. And she moved from Willows, Wisconsin, I suppose it was too small of a town, to New York City and eventually off to Malibu. But this was her home. Uh, she also had a fashion store. Now the fashion stores, the dolls in the dream house and the fashion shop are not my original toys. Those I did purchase after in later years. Uh, the outfits, however, um, do depict some of the original clothing. There's uh, the green dress in the fashion shop, the red dress in the fashion shop, as well as the first stole in the fashion shop and the lady that's purchasing a wedding dress is actually an original Barbie item. 
the dress that's on the doll in the dream house, the knit one, was made by my grandmother. She knit that dress for my Barbie doll. I have the original case that I carried, or more or less schlepped, from house to house every Saturday morning because we played with our Barbie dolls. And I also have the bed that was made by Susie Goose. Susie Goose was not a Mattel product, as Barbie was, but the bed was made for Barbie doll use. On this table, I have put together furniture. Unfortunately, I only have a few pieces of it. Put together furniture was made after the dream house because the dream houses were cardboard and they weren't holding up as well. So they made these plastic pieces that you could put together and build furniture. My original Barbie game. I have a photograph of me at Christmas with our box TV showing me opening up my Barbie doll game that I received as a gift that year. The other dolls on this table I have bought on secondary market. Uh, some of them are the anniversary editions that came out. Others are cross collectibles. If you are an Elvis collector, you have Barbie Loves Elvis. If you're into NASCAR, you have a NASCAR Barbie. There's also a Harley Barbie, and of course, like I said, Barbie was a cheese head. So we have a Wisconsin cheerleader. What not to do with some of your Barbies is trying to play with them over too hard. I do have a little bit of an example of that where one of, my, one of the dolls I picked up has cut hair. A lot of girls cut the hair on their Barbies as a rebellion to the long flowing ponytail that Barbie had. Uh, another one is the jacket on one of the dolls is quite deteriorated and that was from bad, from keeping it in an in unsafe environment for collectibles. And the car is a little bit beat up. That car was actually given to me um, by a friend of mine uh, and she thought that because I had a Barbie collection that I should have a car for Barbie. Uh, the other two dolls are actually bought again on secondary market. They're part of a collector's series. And that's what you're finding more and more now are the collectible series, the Christmas series, cross collectibles, and boxed up Barbies. And um, that's basically my collection. I love Barbie. I wanted to become a fashion designer because of Barbie. I didn't, but um, I work in accounting. But uh, Barbie has been part of my life for like ever. And collecting and finding the pieces again in my basement or in boxes has been just a real joy and I hope that Barbie brings joy to a lot of little girls going forward. Uh, Barbie sold for three dollars originally and there's there's three Barbie sold every minute in the world. So Barbie is a huge, huge success. Hi, my name is Jessica Check, and my husband and Bradley and I um, our collectors of the vintage arcades here on display at the Sheboygan County Museum. Uh, we live in Green Bay and have been collecting for many years. So the exhibit has been up for about six months and is coming to an end this weekend, but it has been a really good experience working with everyone here at the museum. Um, our collection includes a lot of different games, kind of a variety. So uh, we have everything from very classic titles that you would see or that you may remember, like Frogger, Donkey Kong, there's a Q-Bird on display here, to a little more unique games like Bubbles or Three Stooges that may not be as familiar. Uh, we also tried to bring in some newer titles. Uh, one that's recognizable is Fix-It Felix. That was part of the, the Disney movie from a couple years back. So... Um, you know, there's a lot of unique characteristics of the games that we've tried to relay to the public. Um, some of them have very unique artwork or a unique story behind them. Technology during this time, during the late 70s, early 80s, was progressing very quickly. So uh, if you read some of the information on the games, it'll go through what makes that game special, how it was significant, what part or feature or technology was new and different at the time. So um, we've, you know, in addition to the games, had some collectibles on display to really capture just how big the arcade craze was during that time. It wasn't just the arcade games. It was lunchboxes and posters and stickers and patches and every, everything you could think of. So we tried to really bring that feel and that vibe back to the museum to relay to the public. Um, if you would like to see more about the collection or read some information about it, we do maintain a Facebook page. It's called Silver Coin Arcade. 
Think of like a quarter, silver coin arcade. So you can find more information and pictures there. But we have really enjoyed our time at the museum and talking with the public and working with the community. Hi, I'm Bernie Markovich. My hobby is needlepoint. I have been doing this for 35 years. I was interested in needlepoint when I was a boy. My grandmother used to do it. Unfortunately, she only did pre-works, and then on top of it, she only worked in beige wool, and I thought, this is not what I want to be doing. So I didn't, uh, I didn't start then. Uh, my mother taught me how to embroider. That was fun for a while, but, you know, pillowcases, how many of those can you make? So... Uh, about 35 years ago, the late Sarah Axel got me started with needlepoint. She said, you'd really like doing it. So what I did is I bought a, uh, a canvas from her, the bell pole that's down on the end with the roses. And uh, that was the very first piece that I had done. Uh, I realized that in order for me to act actually activate this hobby, I needed to complete something. So that was the very first piece. The roses and the foliage on that bell pull were already worked in. I did the stripes, the background color, and, uh, and I completed it in a reasonable length of time, and I have ever since been hooked on that. Uh, the biggest work that I have done are the six panels that start here. They're the creation. The six pieces uh, were kits that came from England. They were approximately $100 a piece, and it took me three years. I did two a year. The uh, combination with the six pieces is over 369,000 stitches. Uh, I think that it's probably going to become an altar frontal at my church for Advent uh, because it's based on the creation, and that's the be beginning of the church year. The other pieces that I have here um, are um, kits as well. Uh, I've got traditional pieces like this uh, English cruel work, uh, uh, what could become a pillow cover. I've got bold paisley pieces. I've got fruit. Every single one of these uh, is different. Some of them, uh, the piece right behind me, I did in a month's time. It's petty point. Those are smaller stitches worked on canvas that has smaller holes, more holes to the inch. This is what a pre-work piece looks like. Uh, this is all grow point. It's even smaller. And uh, that's worked with a single piece of, uh, uh, of wool. And uh, it takes a lot of time. These color sheets are what you use when you're working with your uh, canvases. The, um, the colors are not necessarily the colors that you're working with. Uh, you may be working with a shade or something like that, but in order to make the canvases uh, legible, you have to see the difference in the colors. So what would happen, and I'm going to get up now and show you this uh, very elaborate um, paisley piece. Here's the worksheet. It's got the colors running down the side. Here's the actual canvas with the colors going down the side and the corresponding pieces of wool. And you got to make this all work. So when I did this, I did each one of the larger paisleys first, like these, and then I went around the edge, and then I filled in the other colors. Uh, you do what is, I think, best for you. I, I start my day when I'm working on a canvas and I date all of them. So uh, I started this canvas on the uh, 30th of May this year, and it, it has 48,000 stitches. And this was done uh, two months later. And uh, what, we, what you will see on the edge of these is a black border. That is for the person that uh, converts these into pillows because I don't want to lose any of the, uh, the colored work that was in there. So she said just do three strands uh, all the way around. I do five because I don't want her to chop off anything. These pieces down at the end were hand-painted canvases. They are always the most expensive. This is Petty Point, and uh, 
I started this on the uh, uh, 2nd of March, and I don't have a finish date, but it, it, it didn't take that long. Sometimes I'll put my initials down in the corner and the year that I've done it. Sometimes I don't, but the bottom line is is that I will knock out two to three pieces of this every year. Uh, I've got a basement full of, <laughs> of finished canvases but unfinished works. I uh, will sometimes do these as Christmas gifts, special occasion gifts. I did this pillow as a Christmas gift last year. It was absolutely stunning when it was finished. It's got, it's got the birds that you can barely see in that, uh, uh, in that canvas with the pears and the, the cherries going around it. And uh, so uh, Pat Vaughn actually assembled the pillow. Uh, the kit was approximately $125. There was another $40 for the, the, the uh, fabric, uh, for the backing of the pillow, the trim that went on it, and then another uh, $50 for, uh, for Pat Vaughn. It's not an inexpensive hobby, but the thing is, is this, this stuff wears like iron. It's absolutely amazing. I have, uh, in the past, bought unfinished... Um, canvases that someone started and never finished uh, uh, and I will take out all the stitches uh, the the beige part <laughs> and I will will start all over again and sometimes I buy those at estate sales so it's a rewarding hobby uh, it's it's color uh, there are things like on this this piece here the cruel part was uh, was pre-worked I bought it at a needlepoint shop in Milwaukee I designed all of this to make it bigger, and uh, uh, the thing is, is that it, it came out quite nice. But the geometry—you <laughs> got to start somewhere and you got to end somewhere, and you hope that it all works out. I actually do pillows that will have quotations on them, and I just stick the needle in the canvas and I'll start the words, and uh, it it works out. It just works out, and I think that because of the experience that I've had with it. But I'll tell you. Of all the things that I do, uh, this has been one of the most rewarding things because I can do it at home. I can do it in a chair. I don't have to lift it. I don't have to drag it anyplace else. All I have to do is finish it. So uh, needlepoint is difficult to find. Uh, it's out of fashion right now. I buy my kits from uh, uh, Ermans in uh, London. Uh, and uh, I, I find that it's, it's really a, a nice hobby. Uh, if you want to do needlepoint stockings for your grandchildren or stuff like that, those kits are available if you can find the catalog. And I think any uh, uh, company that deals with embroidery, crocheting and stuff like that would probably have needlepoint kits. So I, had, I recommend it highly. And, of course, uh, don't forget, Holiday Memories is just around the corner. We're up to our eyeballs in Christmas here at the museum, and we're ready to start next week. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sherry Becker, and I brought my autographed album collection today. Um, the first one I'll talk about is with Peter Frampton. I met him at Summerfest. I don't recall the year, uh, but this is a picture of him signing the autographed album. As you can see here on the bottom, uh, at first he wrote to Cherry, and then he said, wait a minute, I think I spelled your name wrong. So that's me in the corner up there spelling out my name, Sherry. Um, the first album that really got me started as far as collecting different uh, signatures was 38 Special. And that's when they played in Sheboygan around 1994. And from, them, from then on, it pretty much kind of became an obsession for me. Back here I have Firefall, that's when they played at Lake Fest in Sheboygan. And to this day I'm still good friends with them and have them on Facebook and when they come around town they usually will give me a call to come out to see the show. Uh, back here I have Barry Williams, people know him as Greg Brady from the Brady Bunch. He was also playing with like the Cow Sills, um, the Bay City Rollers, which I did get their autograph as well. Um, probably one of my favorites is Loverboy over here. Uh, Matt Frenette, who is the drummer, has some awesome stories to tell. For example, this album right down here. 
Uh, a lot of people think that that's Mike Reno, who's the lead singer of Loverboy. They think that this is actually him in his pants, but it's really the photographer's 13-year-old daughter because Mike Reno could not fit in these pants. Oh, let's see here. The Fix, I'm also friends with them yet, too, so when they do come around um, the Wisconsin area, usually they'll give me a call as well. And what's nice is because one band will uh, be in the same venue as with another band, that's how I end up becoming uh, known with other uh, different bands and getting their signatures as well. Oh, this is my brother from another mother. <laughs> He's actually with the Guess Who, and... Uh, I had to get a close-up with him just because a lot of people were asking me at the Wild Center if that is my brother. I should have just said yes. And, oh, these are some albums that I had from when I was a teenager. They are records. However, I won't play them just because they're, I don't want to scratch them at all, and they are double-sided. And, yeah, so basically... This is my collection, uh, Blue Oyster Cult, also our friends of mine. They played in Sheboygan recently as well. And, oh, one of my oldest, Striper was one of my favorite bands back in the 80s. I was able to get their signatures as well, and then I met them again 15 years later, so that's when I had them sign the actual pictures. So other than that, um, I have over 3,000 albums. These are all the ones that I have signed, and my goal is to get more. But thank you very much. Hey, my name is Mary Mines, and I've been interested in dolls for as long as I can remember. I have all of my childhood dolls, thanks to my parents having kept them. And I started collecting seriously in 1987. I'm, my number one Barbie here is the prize of my collection. Uh, she's one of the first Barbies ever made. The blondes were made two to one to the Burnett, so she's very rare. She has her original stand and her original outfit. And then next to her is a number two Barbie, and she's dressed in a very rare outfit called Roman Holiday. The one next to her is a number three, and she is wearing commuter set. The next number three is wearing an outfit called Easter Parade, and my brunette number three is wearing gay Parisian. Those four outfits were made only in 1959, and then they were discontinued. So they're very hard to find. My first Barbie is right here. I bought her myself. My parents never bought me a Barbie. So I found her at a Ben Franklin store in Port Washington when I was about eight years old and I bought her with my birthday money. And my other first Barbie is this one down here. She's also wearing one of my original outfits. The rest I've collected over the years. My friend Diane and I go to estate sales, garage sales, doll shows, conventions, and I've collected all of these over the years. I have a lot of very hard-to-find outfits and some easy-to-find outfits. Down this way are a lot of the uh, mod era, it's called, dolls, including Barbie's friends Stacy, Christy, PJ, Ju excuse me, Julia, a lot of other dolls. These are twist-and-turn Barbies, and I have all these dolls in their original outfits. This is Barbie's boyfriend, Ken, over here. And then down on this section, these are just a few of the dolls that I have in their original boxes. Some of them do have their original wrist tags, like this skipper, which is very hard to find. And then down on this end, a lot of these are Barbie's little sister, Skipper, and her friends, Scooter, and ginger, and there's a fluff over here. And moving on, we have Cho Cho Chan. This is a skipper doll from Japan. They were only sold in Japan, so these are really hard to find in the United States. She is not wearing her original outfit. Then over here we have Francie dolls. 
Francie's friend Casey right here. And this is a black Francie. Again, these were very hard to find. They weren't on the market very long. They were made in the 70s. They weren't very popular, so Mattel pulled them from the market. So they're very hard to find. And this particular outfit is also extremely rare. In the box, if you can still find it, it would be worth anywhere from three to $4,000. I did not pay that much for those. <laughs> And then my friend Diane also brought a few Tammy dolls over here. And she's made and by Ideal. Tammy's made by Ideal. And Tammy. this is Pose and Tammy. 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 Ted, her brother. Ted, her brother. And Pepper, and Pepper her which sister. is her little sister. Uh, this is another doll I collect. She's by Kenner, and she's called Darcy. These three are original Darcy's. This is... Darcy's friend Erica and her friend Dana. Darcy never had a boyfriend. She was only on the market for two or three years and she was discontinued because she didn't have the impact of competing with Barbie that Kenner had hoped for. But she's an extremely high quality doll with a lot of nice outfits as well. And then I also do Barbie restorations. For example, this is a photo of a before picture. The doll's hair was badly cut. Her face needed new paint. She was very mistreated. And this is the result of rerooting her. And I made her um, an original outfit. So never throw away those old dolls. They can still be somebody's treasure. I'm Rick Seidemann, and this is my son, Noah. He's going to tell us about his outfit and some of the clothing and things he has on. So why don't you tell us what you got on, bud? I got powder horn that holds powder. What kind of powder? Gunpowder. Okay. What else do you have? Tomahawk that you throw. Okay. A canteen that holds water that leaks right if you put real water in it. And a haversack that's filled up with games. All right, why don't you turn and show them the haversack. All right, and then they can see the tomahawk and the, uh, and the powder horn a little bit better. What else do you have on? What kind of hat are you wearing? Tricorn hat. Okay, why is it called a tricorn? Because it looks like a corn. Okay, it looks like a corn. And it's got three corners? Yes. All right. What about, what about on your legs? Leggings. Okay. What kind of pants are you wearing? Britches. Okay. And what, what's your, what kind of coat are you wearing? What, what are you wearing? Like you got... What else do you have on? You got your coat and your waistcoat? Yes. And your shirt? Yes. And then you got your neck stock? N neck your stock. Yeah. Anything else you want to show them? My belt. Oh, your belt? Oh, okay. What about what about your fire lock? You want to show me your fire lock? Can you can you go to shoulder? Can you do make ready? Present, fire. Very good. We're here uh, showing off our reenacting uh, collection, I guess. Uh, we reenact the French Indian War. And it's kind of funny because when I got contacted by the Historical Society to bring my collection here, I really didn't think of myself as a collector. I mean, I've got patch collections and other collections, but I didn't really think of my French and were reenacting stuff is a collection. I still didn't even up until like a couple days ago. But when I was coming here yesterday, I was thinking about it and I had all my bins. I'm like, I am a collector. And what I really am a collector of is, I guess, the different clothing, the different interpretations, the different impressions that I can do as a reenactor. And I started out doing um, reenacting in 1997. I went to um, 
an event over at the uh, Farmers and Sportsmen's Club. It was called a, a fur trade rendezvous. Actually, no, I should take that back. It was right here. It was a fur trade rendezvous right here at the Historical Society. My dad invited me to it, and that's what got me into reenacting. Uh, and so I started going to all these fur trade ones, and the one that got me into French and Indian War was at the Farmers and Sportsmen's Club. And ever since then, I started, well, I actually joined that group, and that was doing this impression over here, Rogers Rangers. They were the scouts uh, for the British Army during the French and Indian War. They wore green uniforms, sometimes brown uniforms, gray uniforms, but uniforms that blended in the woods, and they fought the French and the Native Americans in their own style, a hit-and-run guerrilla-type warfare. And then after a while, I ventured away from doing rangers. I wanted to do the British red coat. So I wanted to stick with the same type of tactics, and I went to a British light infantry uniform, and that's this here. But I'll talk a little bit more about that after I talk about some of the other impressions I have. My main impression is British light infantry um, and the 55th Regiment. And over here is a private's coat <clears throat> like what the British Army, most of the British Army used, and this is a 55th Regiment coat. This is what they would have looked like, their coats would have looked like if, when they came off the boats at Nova Scotia and then in New York in 1757. These long uh, coat tails, the bright yellow lace, the green facings, what we call facings, and that, that identified this regiment as the 55th, these green facings and the yellow lace. And uh, they would be wearing a hat like this called a tricorn hat or a, or a cocked hat. And their commander was a man named Lord George Augustus Viscount Howe. And he, when he got to New York, met Major Robert Rogers, who commanded the Rangers. And he went out on scouts with Robert Rogers trying to find better tactics for the British Army to use, better clothing and equipment and what he came up with in 1757 was a, a coat similar to this it was cut down short shorter than the highland coats um, they took the lace off the coats they took their tricorn hats cut them down into short round caps with two uh, two to two and a half inch brims and that's what they fought the ticonderoga campaign in 1758 unfortunately for him in the opening skirmish of the battle, he was shot in the lungs and perished immediately. And after the campaign, these uniforms weren't very um, well uh, received by the British Army and the soldiers and the men. And then when winter came, they definitely weren't very warm for the soldiers. So they went back to more of the, the, uh, the former style. But what the British Army did was create a light infantry company in every regiment. And that's this uniform. That's, that was my main impression for a number of years. Uh, 55th Regiment, Company of Light Infantry. So I still have the green facings, but I got to take off the lace so I could blend in the woods. It's actually pretty much a hybrid between the two uniforms, a good compromise. Um, the, uh, they added wings, and these wings actually act as, as like a cape. When I've been at events when it's raining, this, this wicks or... or takes the moisture off my shoulders and brings it down to like a cape would. So it has a practical purpose. Um, so then after a while, I ventured to a new uniform, and that's what I'm wearing right now. This is Gage's Light Infantry, or the 80th Regiment of Light Armed Foot. And um, this was 1758, this unit was created, and this was created basically to do the job of the Rangers. Uh, the British Army did not like the, the lack of discipline in the the Colonial Rangers, so they wanted to create their own Ranger Regiment, and that was Gage's Light Infantry. So this is the first British Army Regiment that wasn't a red-coated regiment. They were brown uniforms and were used for scouting and, and doing those type of duties. And the other cool thing about this uniform is that in 1761, after the French Union War ended, the British sent out soldiers to the Great Lakes to garrison different posts here. And the main unit, the garrison, the post was a unit called the 60th Royal Americans. But the unit that 
escorted the 60th Royal Americans from Detroit to Michilimackinac to what Bay, or what we know as Green Bay today, was Gage's Light Infantry. They went from Detroit, they went along the Upper Peninsula, down to Green Bay, then around the uh, Door Peninsula, and down the coast of Wisconsin, all the way towards uh, Chicago, along the bottom of Lake Michigan, to the St. Joseph River, and then they went through the river over to present-day Niles, Michigan, left another garrison there. So I get to be a unit that was actually in Wisconsin, short time in October, but in Wisconsin, and who knows, maybe they came to Sheboygan, we don't know. Um, there's a map of the expedition in the in England. Um, one of the uh, members of the museum, Keith Witter, has actually examined that map and written about it. He lives in Michigan now and worked for the Mackinac State Parks Commission. But uh, as far as my correspondence with him, he, it doesn't show any of the campsites that they used. So this is kind of some of the stuff. Um, a lot of the clothing here, um, I've made some of it. I've purchased. I've gotten to the point now where the clothing that I'm going to be making, I'm going to be doing... Um, here I have a great kilt for a Highland Battalion or a Highland Regiment. And I'm going to be putting together a Highland impression. So that's my next on my collection list. And also I'm, I'm going to be putting together, hand sewing a 60th Royal Americans uniform for when I go up to Green Bay and interpret a Heritage Hill as a... Uh, Gorell's, uh, James Gorell's garrison. He was the commander of that garrison, and he was from Maryland. So um, I've got a few of my other items here. One people always like to see is the the firelock or musket. This is a light infantry carbine. It's a carbine because it's smaller in caliber than the 75 caliber brown bess, and it's shorter than the 46 inch barrel brown bess at 42 inches and 65 caliber. So this is a sh lighter, shorter weapon than most of the British soldiers carried. Uh, this is what the light infantrymen carried. So a lot of people like to see that. It uses a uh, flintlock mechanism to fire where the flint would strike the hammer and setting off a spark and laying out the gunpowder and eventually ejecting a, a projectile. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff here. I could talk for hours on hours about everything, but uh, pretty much uh, the rundown of our collection and uh, and we're just we're happy to be here and, and show it off for the Historical Society. Good afternoon. My name's Augie Marginal. I just turned 79, which if you do the math, means I was born in 1939. And growing up in the 40s and 50s, there was a lot of great radio shows on before TV. And the, the advantage of radio, uh, you only needed one sponsor for the show, not 13 like you have now for the TV, because the needs of the show were very limited. And you could have people sitting around a table reading scripts and they would paint a picture in your mind. And in reality, if you looked at, you know, the imagination you had in your mind, it was, you could be in color. You could ride with the Roan Ranger. You could ride with the Green Hornet and just put yourself into that imaginary world that they were projecting for you. Now, one of the other things that uh, I was going to talk about is just in modern day, now we have Bob Euchre who broadcasts the Brewers games, and he paints you a picture of what's going on on the ball field. And one, one is a ground ball, one is a double play, a pop-up. But Bob Euchre could tell you that right now there's a pink elephant sitting on second base. And in your mind, you could picture that pink elephant on second base by the magic of using the radio. Okay. Now, I, the other things I was going to talk about is uh, some of the tapes I brought along were, were mainly radio heroes. The good guys always won. Um, I'm a big Lone Ranger fan. I still am. Uh, I've got a lot of Lone Ranger collection. I, I designed this shirt. Uh, there was a, t a lot of jewelry that was being passed out for kids. What would Jesus do? So I got to say, well, what would the Lone Ranger do? So I, I went down to Oosburg, had some, some shirts made like this, and I want everybody to know that, uh, that I'm a Lone Ranger fan. Now, uh, one of the things, I, when I talk about radio, I would help uh, some of the kids at, at James Madison School when I was with a lunch buddy there through the Big Brothers program, and I would teach these kids about sound effects. And I, I had two examples, and I'll, I'll try to do one today for you. And it had, one had to do with a Western story where the cattle were disappearing, and he just didn't know what to do, so they sent out Sheriff Mike. Now, in the, in the radio shows, you had to have a partner with you 
to talk so you could set the scenario, like we're going to that mountain or let's camp by this stream. Uh, but And sometimes the, the, the main character only had his horse to talk to. So he would talk that they were, tra- they were trailing this, looking for these cattle. And he said, well, you know, and they would have a sound effect. I'll see if I can pick it up here with these with the cups. I don't know if this... And in your mind, you had that picture of a horse, and then he'd, he'd slow the horse down, and he'd tell the horse, well, we're going to stop at this cabin in the woods. And he looked at, the, there the cabin is, but it's got a light on. And he said, well, I shouldn't have a light on. I'm going to investigate. So he'd walk through the snow, and to make sound for snow, you take a box of cornstarch. I don't know if you can pick this up, but you squeeze it. I'll try it a little harder here. And that would be the sound going through the snow. And in your picture, he's walking through the snow. When he got to the cabin, inside the cabin now, there's a big hydraulic cylinder painted blue. There's steam coming out of it. There's a fire on it, and it's tied. There's a rope to it. And in your mind, that thing actually took place. And they would bring the cattle in the doors, and they were, what are they going to do with the cattle and that big hydraulic machine? Well, they put the cattle tail tied to the rope on the hydraulic machine, and then what they would do to make a sound effect, they, they say they started turning the cattle inside out. And to make that sound, they used this, this balloon. And that was supposed to be a cow being turned inside out so they could take it and put it in a truck and, and leave the area. Now, that's one example. The other one was in early radio, they didn't have the ability to broadcast baseball like they do now. Whoever broadcast it, say, in New York, they would put it on a tape, and they would send it through a wire, and then they would have a printer, like a, a ticker tape thing, and they would have an announcer, and he would have a machine here with a crowd noise that he could make it loud and soft, depending on what was going on in the game. And he would have a bat and a little ball or something to hit it with, signifying a hit. Well, let's say the game in New York, the, uh, the home team is down by eight or ten runs in the last of the ninth. Now, who's going to listen to the end of the game? They might as well go cut the grass or do something else. But they had an obligation to keep the people interested because whoever was, was advertising that game, like some of these moms, apple pie or razor blades, they had to change the story to make it, enhance it to make it a little more exciting. So let's say at the bottom of the night, first guy up, well, he flew out to right. Okay. Now, the right fielder's name was Schwartz, so he could say, okay, Thompson hit the ball. And Schwartz is under it. He's got it. That wasn't very exciting. So he could jazz it up a little bit in the first pitch, and he hit the bat and go doink. And it'd be, oh, there's a long drive in the right field going back, back. Schwartz is running up. He hit the wall, and he's crumpled around. He's laying on the ground. He's hurt. And here come the, the trainers out to check on him. And they, they're working on or giving artificial respiration. And it, people are listening to this, see? And finally they say, I see his foot is moving. He's... He's standing up, and the ball is in his glove. And so they jazz it up, and now people are going to listen to that game the rest of the time and, and help the sponsor. Now, other things that I have here, you know, all the heroes, they're radio heroes. But there's something like uh, a little bit of history on World War II on D-Day. That was a secret operation by the military. And so they, they didn't give out anything, but there were home broadcasts on what was going on in Germany because... People were intercepting or listening to the German radio show, and they were telling people paratroopers landing here or there's landing in France and to do things. So they got, we got the, uh, the information for broadcast here in the States from the German radio itself. Now, a lot of those shows trans- <clears throat> transcribed or transformed themselves into television. But again, then when you got, you got a big stage and a big set, whereas before it, it was imagination. And I think it helped us because as kids... Uh, we could come home from school, it was dark outside at 4.30, and we could ride with the Lone Ranger or ride with the Green Hornet. And one of the things, <clears throat> in, in school we would learn history of the United States. But if you, if you listen to the, to the radio shows, you find out <clears throat> the Lone Ranger's real name was, was John, and he, uh, let's see, John Reed. And when he, we were ambushed by the Cavendish gang, and everybody was killed except him, Tonto found him and says, you Lone Ranger now. So now he was the Lone Ranger. 
but he had a nephew named Dan who was coming west with his mother. His mother was killed in an Indian attack, so now Dan is all alone, but he was adopted by a woman named Grandma Frisbee. And the Lone Ranger runs into Grandma Frisbee and finds out she's got his nephew there. Well, the nephew, Dan Reed, as he grows up, becomes a newspaper editor and has a son named Britt Reed. And Britt Reed was the Lone Ranger's great nephew, but he was the Green Hornet. So he started out with the Lone Ranger, who had a Native American as a partner, wore a mask. His great nephew was the Green Hornet, wore a mask, and had a, a partner named Kato, who was Japanese, until December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Then, all of a sudden, Kato became a Filipino. So there's fun in lurking up the history of this, and it, you know, it, you can you can put a puzzle together. You, it, the, the TV doesn't suck up all your attention. You can you can put a model airplane together and uh, and talk with other people and listen to the radio. And it was a fantastic era. And it, there are some sh uh, radio uh, shows locally that will play them uh, particularly, but uh, it's a part of my life, and I can't let go. So thank you, Fred Bedke, and here from the uh, museum and. I thought I'd bring in some of the more interesting parts of the Schlitz collection that I have. I do have the signs and the bottles and the cans and everything, but I think everybody has seen those. So I thought this is a little uh, kind of the trinkets that a lot of people don't see. I've got advertising from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, some of the stuff in the case, I've got badges, security badges. I've got badges for the employees. Uh, Schlitz Dictionary, and they also Schlitz made a atlas, and the reason they made their atlas is that they could show everybody where they had all their plants. They even had a plant in Pakistan at one time. But kind of as we kind of go down through the table, they've got the the old steel can opener from the from the uh, early '60s. Various tap handles, a lot of different advertising. But this is some stuff now that people don't see. It's a Schlitz coffee maker. It's a Schlitz popcorn maker. A couple of little interesting robot trinkets that are made out of Schlitz cans. More advertising. We've got a Schlitz can from Pakistan. Cigarette lighter. There's a bunch of lighters in the cabinet. The anniversary stein for 125th anniversary. And if you were a really good distributor, then they, they would give you the, uh, it's actually a globe, but it was brandy in there. Does, it never, they never said who made the brandy, but you had to be a really good distributor to get that. This is a big stein that was made into a, a bank. Erlinger, that was one of their premium beers that they decided that they were going to try and make a premium beer, but they decided they, they went back to just the Schlitz. One of the original tap tappers. Now this doesn't doesn't go on the bottle. It actually goes in the bar, and it's right right around 1900s. Got a got a picture here of an astronaut, me with an astronaut. I wanted to have him hold a Schlitz can, but he couldn't do it. A so. uh, couple different pictures, more advertising stuff, a lot of different steins, and again the. Majority of the steins and stuff and bottles I didn't bring along. We've got blob top bottles pre, this, this is probably like 1880. And we've got other bottles here with the, with the stopper still in them. Again, 1800s. We've got this picture would be where you'd come in with a, on a stagecoach or a wagon or whatever. And you'd want beer up in your, in your hotel room. That's how they'd bring it up. The uh, anniversary glass from the Chicago Fire. And as a matter of fact, the Chicago Fire, when they did have the Chicago Fire, Joseph Schlitz says, I want you to take every wagon we got and fill it up with beer and water, take it to Chicago. And they, I don't know how, many, how much beer they did truck, but a lot of beer and a lot of water. And when Chicago started building itself back up, that's how the, the, they got the slogan, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And that's, that's how they really got their foothold in, in Illinois. Uh, Schlitz Lava Lamp. And all kinds of advertising. 
but again, it's uh, this is the stuff that a lot of the people don't see. The, the Schlitz uniform, all the different shirts, more, and I have no idea what language this is. <laughs> but uh, we kind of put it next to each other. You can see the difference. But there's a quilt. There's a wastebasket. There's a, a hook, a hooking rug, different caps. This particular Hawaiian shirt is a real Hawaiian shirt, and that Schlitz made when they opened their plant in Hawaii. They had all of these Schlitz, uh, Hawaiian shirts made for Schlitz. So it is an original Hawaiian shirt. Bratwurst days, 1962, everybody, anybody that knows Sheboygan remembers Bratwurst days. Probably not the end of it, but the beginning of the day. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, yeah, like I say, everything else is just trinkets that people normally wouldn't see, and I thought, well, I'll bring it along and share.